Well, good morning and welcome to our September 26th service here at Sauble Christian Fellowship. It's great to be together again this morning and I want to thank you for taking some time out of your weekend to spend in worship. More than just singing songs and hearing a message today, we believe as you focus in on God this morning that God will meet you where you are and you will know His presence is with you. My name is Ken and it's a pleasure for me to be your host today. Last week, we started a new teaching series called Reset, looking at the early church and how they lived out their faith. And this morning, we are back into that for week two. But before we get started, here's our weekly update. Whether you are attending in person or online, we believe that being on a team is a great way for you to get connected with other people. We would love for you to discover and put to use some of the skills and abilities that are you. Whether you're a people person and you want to be a part of making people feel welcome, or maybe you're more of a techie and want to help everything run smoothly tech-wise. Are you passionate about sharing Jesus with the next generation in kids ministry? If you are, we have a place for you to serve. When we all pitch in and help, together we accomplish the mission we have for people to know God, become like Jesus, and change our world. It won't happen as effectively without you, so please consider how you can be a part. Go to team.sobblechurch.ca and let us know how we can get you plugged in. Last year, a number of our ladies took part in a Fall Secret Friend event that was put on by our ladies' ministry, and it was such a great time, they've decided to run it again this year. Starting October 18th for four weeks long, Fall Secret Friend is a way to keep connected and build a new friendship by encouraging and showing kindness to another woman from our community. With a little money and some creativity, you can put together a small surprise, give a note of encouragement, or deliver some homemade treats. It's up to you how you bless your secret friend. Sign up now to be a part of this year's Fall Secret Friend by going to sobblechurch.ca events or email woman at sobblechurch.ca for more information. Next week is the first Sunday of the month when we plan to celebrate communion together and collect an offering for benevolence needs. One of the benefits of being a part of a church community is that in times of need, we can come alongside each other and as Galatians 6.2 encourages us, carry each other's burdens, share the load. This month, we have an opportunity to come alongside one of our own in this. You may or may not have heard that Kim Chapel is preparing to head to Germany October 10th where she will undergo a specialized back operation that should alleviate the chronic pain and restore her range of motion that has continued to decline as a result of a number of health issues. The surgery is not cheap and it's all out of pocket. They have been working towards raising the funds needed to go already, but have a ways to go. Your church board has agreed that the October Benevolence Offering will go towards this need. Everything that comes in for this offering on October 3rd will go towards their expenses, but also will be matched up to 5000 We hope to bless them with a good chunk towards their costs, so please pray about how you can help to come alongside George and Kim and family on October 3rd. As we prepare to worship today, let's focus on why we are here. We want to acknowledge and give praise to the one true living God. We want to remember His greatness, His kindness, His power. And we want to do this together. Even though you are online and you may not have anyone else around you right now, God is omnipresent. He is just as much there with you right now as He is with me here. And His Spirit connects us, whether close or distant. The psalmist in Psalm 96 writes, O oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord, all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. Let's praise him together today. 1 Peter 1 verse 3 to 5 says, 
All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy that we have been born again. Because God raised Jesus from the dead, now we live with great expectation, and we have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay. And through your faith, God is protecting you by his power until you receive this salvation, which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see. Let's sing about that salvation. Let's sing about the fact that our Redeemer lives. does live. You know, according to the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia, the expression references God in Daniel uh, 7 a few times, and uh, it references him as ancient of days. And according to this encyclopedia, it says it's not intended to suggest that um, uh, the existence of God from eternity to the past the end of time. Um, they say that what Daniel sees is actually uh, an old man, a weathered man, an aged man, and uh, like a judge almost. So I think maybe a few of us in the congregation can resonate with that a little bit. I don't have the woolly white hair, but in Daniel 7, 9, it says, As I looked, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow, and his hair, uh, his head was white like wool. His throne was flaming with fire, and his wheels were all ablaze. So there you go. It's okay to be old. Not a problem. But uh, actually, you know, this next song, Ancient of Days, 
is, uh, is actually about unifying as, as Christians. I want to just um, really emphasize the chorus. It says, every tongue in heaven and earth shall declare your glory. Every knee shall bow at your throne in worship. You will be exalted, O God. I think, you know, sometimes we pick these hills to die on when it comes to, you know, opinions and, and things like that. But this song is singing about the fact that, you know what, those hills are going to go away real quick when, when Jesus comes and when God is sitting on his throne. And uh, we are going to worship the Ancient of Days as a unified body of Christ. So let's sing about that this morning. Sing and honor, glory and power, the end to the ancient of day. From every nation, all of creation, bow before the ancient of day. Every tongue in heaven and earth shall declare your glory, every knee shall bow in your throne. In worship, you will be exalted, O oh God. And your kingdom shall not pass away, O oh, ancient of days. Blessing and honor, glory and power, be unto the ancient of days. In every nation, all of creation bow before the ancient of day every tongue in heaven and earth shall declare your glory every knee shall bow in your throne in worship you will be exalted O oh god and your kingdom shall not pass away O oh, ancient of day, O oh, ancient of day, your kingdom shall reign over all the earth. Sing unto the ancient of days For none can compare to your matchless worth Sing unto the ancient of days Your kingdom shall reign over all the earth Sing unto the ancient of days For none can compare to this word sing to the ancient of days every tongue in heaven and earth shall declare your glory every knee shall bow in your throne in worship you will be exalted O oh God and your kingdom shall not pass away O oh ancient of days Jesus, we just thank you that you are the King of Kings, that you are exalted above all things. God, we just praise, we praise you as the Father, we praise you as the Son, and we praise you as the Holy Spirit.
to reveal the kingdom come and to reconcile the lost to redeem the whole creation you did not despise the cross for even in your suffering you sought to the other side knowing this is our salvation Jesus for our sake you died Hallelujah 
If you have your Bibles handy, you can have it open to Acts chapter 2. Let me just read uh, verse 42. Luke writes that all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. We talked about that last week. These early Jesus followers were devoted to the apostles' teaching about Jesus. And we ask ourselves the question, what would it look like for us to press reset and to devote ourselves to taking seriously the words of Jesus. And the rest of verse 42, they devoted themselves to fellowship, to fellowship. 
Some of my earliest memories uh, as a kid are of being in church. At our church, Sunday school was at 10 o'clock and the morning worship service was at 11 o'clock and the evening service was at eight o'clock. And as I think about that now, that just seems so late, like we'd never get away with that now. In fact, I texted my sister just to make sure I was remembering correctly. Was this at eight o'clock? And she said, yep, it was. And the thinking was that uh, farmers could get their chores done, could milk the cows and be at church for eight o'clock. And, um, you know, one day somebody made the uh, astute observation looking around the room, realizing mm, there are actually no farmers attending. Uh, so why don't we move this to seven o'clock, which they did. One of the things about the evening service I liked as a kid was every once in a while, I'm not sure how often, maybe quarterly, maybe more frequently than that, we would have after church fellowship. And that meant that after the evening service, we would go downstairs to the church basement. We would eat tiny sandwiches and rubbery celery. Once in a while, somebody might make jello with those little marshmallows in it. That was a big hit. But my friends and I, we would, uh, we would tend to hang out by the big coffee pot and we would see how many sugar cubes that we could kind of smuggle without getting caught. Remember those little square boxes of sugar cubes? And we'd put those in our pockets and then we'd head off somewhere else in the church building and we would eat said sugar cubes. And we called that fellowship. Well, what does fellowship mean to you? We are Sobel Christian Fellowship. What does that mean? Are we living up to our name? How would we know? How do you, how do you measure for that? What did it mean that these early followers of Jesus were devoted to fellowship? Were they devoted to uh, tiny sandwiches and sugar cubes? I, I don't think so. The Greek word that is translated fellowship in verse 42 is koinonia. And the root of koinonia is koinos, which means common. So you could literally say that this church, this early church was devoted to that which they held in common. And that which they held in common was Jesus. We made the point a few weeks ago as we were introducing this series that we can tend to want to uh, romanticize this early church and to look at them and say, oh, they were so devoted to, to, um, uh, to community, so devoted to community. Um, I, I really don't think they were. I don't think this was a group of people who said, you know, let's just be this really tight knit group of people. No, it was Jesus. It was their commonality in Jesus. It was their connectedness in Jesus that pulled them together into community. And their connectedness in Jesus was so strong that it could bear the weight of diversity. If you glance back to verse 41, Luke says, those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day about 3,000 in all. These, um, so these first Jesus followers in this Jerusalem church, these ones who were devoted to taking the words of Jesus seriously, who were devoted to the, the koinonia, to their fellowship, to their commonality in Jesus. Well, these were ones who, verse 41, believed what Peter said. Well, what does that mean? Well, we talked, I think, last week a little bit about the fact that in Acts 2, Peter gets up and he preaches a sermon, a gospel message, basically says this, fellow Israelites, listen to me. Jesus of Nazareth, you killed him. God's raised him from the dead. He is Lord. Everything that Jesus said is absolutely true. So these early believers had accepted what Peter said about Jesus. They'd surrendered their lives to Jesus based on what Peter said, and about 3,000 of them came to faith in Jesus that day. And then they demonstrated that belief in baptism. And uh, in this series, I'm not gonna say anything about baptism um, because Ken is gonna talk specifically about baptism on a Sunday next month. In fact, it'll be October 31st to be uh, specific. And so anyway, here we are, verse 42. Here's these believers. They're devoted to the words of Jesus. They're devoted to their commonality in Christ. Devoted to Jesus, not devoted to community, 
devoted to Jesus. In fact, this was really a group of people so diverse, they essentially had no human reason to actually be together. In fact, let me uh, read beginning at verse five, Acts two, verse five, and just we'll get a sense of just how diverse this group of people is. So verse five, Luke says, at that time, there were devout Jews from, look at this, every nation living in Jerusalem. They'd gone to Jerusalem for Passover. And now here we are, Acts 2, seven weeks later, they're still here because of all the stuff that's been going on in Jerusalem. Verse six, when they heard the loud noise, so um, the Holy Spirit has been poured out and now all these apostles are proclaiming the good news message of Jesus in languages that they've never previously learned. And so uh, when they heard this loud noise, everyone came running and they were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers. They were completely amazed. How can this be, they exclaimed. These people are all from Galilee, and yet we hear them speaking in our own native languages. Here we are, now notice the diversity here. Parthians, Medes, Elamites, people from Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, the province of Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the areas of Libya around Cyrene. Visitors from Rome, look at this, both Jews and Gentile converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. And we hear all these people speaking in our own languages about the wonderful things God has done. They stood there amazed and perplexed. What can this mean, they asked each other. So you get a sense of the diversity. This early church was brought into community, not because everybody had the same culture, they didn't. They were brought into community, not because they all spoke the same language, they didn't. Not because they all had the same socioeconomic standing, they didn't. Not because they all shared the same political views, I'm quite sure they didn't. It was Jesus. Jesus was their koinonia. He was their commonality. You know, we've all probably had politics on the brain um, this last, uh, particularly this last week with our federal election having taken place this past Monday. And of course, we had a, a month of uh, campaigning before that. And it's been really interesting because during the last month, I've been asked by, I don't wanna say a lot of people, but by a few people um, about my political views. I've been asked about um, whether Sobel Church has any particular political bent or if our denominational family has any kind of uh, take on, on politics. And let me just briefly answer how I responded to these inquiries. And uh, so what I'll say is really my opinion, right? I'm throwing out more opinions in this series than normal, partly because I, I wanna be aware that we've got small groups that are meeting, uh, drilling down on this content and the Acts 2 passage. And just in case the conversation lags in any of these small groups, I want, I want there to be some fodder for conversation. So I'll toss a, a hand grenade or two out um, along the way. So I'll share my opinion. This is not the opinion of our staff. I'm not representing our board or our church or our denomination, but just my personal opinion. And here's how I answered people when they asked if Sobel Church has any particular political bent. I said, if you are conservative, Sobel Church is for you. And they said, okay, conservative, thank you. But I said, but wait, if you are liberal, Sobel Church is for you. And they're like, okay, that's weird, conservative and liberal. I said, but wait, if you are NDP, Bloc Quebecois, Green, PPC, Sobel Church is for you. Here's my take on elections, all right? And again, this is my take. And since we're talking about the early church, we're talking about first century, let me, let me put it into uh, first century lingo. An election is Caesar asking you your opinion about how to run the kingdom of this world. And so if this past Monday, if you gave Caesar your opinion, uh, Great. The kingdoms of this world, including the kingdom of Canada, operate according to three things, power, wealth, and recognition. Power, wealth, 
and recognition. Power as expressed through their military. They need uh, power to be an independent nation and not to be in servitude to others. Wealth, um, they need money to fund the military and other things that are expressed in their economy and creating infrastructure and so on. And recognition, the kingdoms of this world want loyalty from their subjects. They'll coerce it if uh, necessary. And they want to be legitimized in the face of the world. At least they want to be seen as a threat. They want to be noticed and to be seen as real players with real power and real clout on the world stage. That's how the kingdoms of this world operate. Power, wealth, and recognition. And so this past Monday, we gave our opinion about who we felt was best to control the levers of power, wealth, and recognition in the Kingdom of Canada. And so we elected leaders. And we um, returned to power a government. And like governments do, they'll uh, impose laws and they'll lead in a top-down way from a position of power. That's how the political kingdoms operate. And while that kind of top-down leadership from a position of power, while it can make change, it can, it can make good change, and it can make bad change, but one thing it can never change is the human heart. And what did Jesus say to his followers about that kind of top-down leadership from a position of power? He said, it shall not be so among you. Remember that time, Jesus is about to enter into Jerusalem for that, for that last time. And as he does so, his disciples are arguing amongst themselves, posturing and um, kind of jockeying for position because it's in their mind that when Jesus goes to Jerusalem, he's going to establish a political kingdom. Um, and, and they're jockeying for positions of power so that they can wield power in this top-down kind of leadership from positions of, of power. They think that Jesus is going to set up a political kingdom that's going to expel the, the Roman occupiers. And Jesus says, it shall not be so among you. You see, the kingdom of Jesus operates completely upside down. Think about the kingdom of Jesus in relation to power, wealth, and recognition. King Jesus laid aside his power and he became a servant and he calls us to follow him. The throne of King Jesus was a cross. In terms of wealth, Jesus said a man's life, a person's life, does not consist in the abundance of the things that they possess. Jesus said, foxes have holes and birds have nests, but I, the Son of Man, don't have anywhere to lay my head. In terms of demanding recognition or being um, considered to be great, Jesus said, let the one who wants to be great learn to be the servant of all. And Jesus modeled greatness when he went to the cross and he gave his life for us and he invites us into relationship with him to live this kingdom life. The kingdom of Jesus is upside down. The kingdom of Jesus advances not by killing its enemies, but by loving its enemies. The kingdom of Jesus advances not by trying to control people, but by serving people. The kingdom of Jesus advances not by trying to coerce loyalty from people, but by winning loyalty through acts of self-sacrificial love. The kingdom of Jesus is absolutely radical. It's upside down. It doesn't look like any political kingdom of this world, liberal, conservative, NDP, any of them. The kingdom of Jesus is upside down to all of those. And it's, it's crazy looking, this kingdom. Like, think of it. The greatest day in the kingdom of Jesus was the day that our leader got himself crucified. Like the kingdoms of this world look at this kingdom of Jesus as stupid, as foolish. In fact, the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, he says, the message of the cross, the message of a crucified king to the world is foolishness. 
And that word foolish is the Greek word Maria, from which we get our English word moronic. That's how the world looks at the kingdom of Jesus. But what does Jesus say? He says, boy, if you've got eyes to see, well, it's the most beautiful kingdom that you can ever possibly imagine. And you know, if you've come to the place in your life where you've just kind of awakened to the futility and the, um, the emptiness of chasing after power, wealth, and recognition, well, this kingdom of Jesus is just, man, it's just this breath of fresh air. And if you come to the place in your life where you're just, you're, you're just fed up. Every time you turn on the news, there's violence and there's conflict and there's um, this nonstop cycle of, of bloodshed and there's lies and there's corruption and there's this, this bondage to sin. If you're just thoroughly sick of all of that, well, this kingdom of Jesus, well, it's the only kingdom in which to live. And if you've come to the place in your life where you've actually lost confidence in the Caesars of this world, the prime ministers and the presidents and the parliaments and the senates and the monarchies, you've come to the conclusion that, you know what? They really don't know what they're doing and they're not doing a good job running the world and they can't fix the problems of this world. Well, if you've come to that conclusion, while well, this kingdom of Jesus is the only kingdom worth placing your trust in. And if you've come to the place in your life where you realize you're a sinner and you can't fix your past, you can't undo what you've done, you can't unscramble the egg, and you've come to the humility of that point, well, this kingdom of Jesus, it's salvation. Jesus is not just king, he's savior. He can be your savior. You can say yes to Jesus as savior and Lord. And the promise uh, that God makes is that the kingdom of Jesus, well, it wins in the end. Like Rome, the Roman empire, the Roman kingdom, it had a great run, but it came to an end. The kingdoms of this world, Canada, United States, China, Russia, all will come to an end. You know, kingdoms of this world, they come on the scene, they're large and in charge, they go all shock and awe, and then they come to an end. Rome had like a really great run, but this kingdom of Jesus, well, what does Isaiah say? Of his kingdom, there shall be no end. Why? Because the kingdom of Jesus does not operate according to power, wealth, and recognition. I brought my passport with me. This is my passport. It says that I am a Canadian citizen. Let me see the picture. Well, it's not a good picture. Um, actually, I remember having that picture done. It was quite embarrassing, actually. Um, got that done at the CAA office, and they took all the pictures, and then uh, they came back a few minutes later and said, we got to do them again. There's too much glare coming off your forehead. <laughs> and uh, so they had to put makeup on me, which was pretty embarrassing, sitting in the middle of the store. Um, hopefully, my, not, my uh, forehead is not a distraction uh, to you today. But this says that I am a Canadian citizen and I love, I love being Canadian. I, I am, I'm delighted to be Canadian. There's really no other country that I would rather live in than Canada. And based on Monday's election, Justin Trudeau is my prime minister and I'm fine with that. I would have been fine with others and I'm fine with that. And I will pray for Justin Trudeau as I have been and for other political leaders because God says to, because God has this incredible thing called providence where he will work through even flawed political systems for my good. And so he calls on us to, to pray and to submit and to honor and, and so on, and so I do. And so I'm glad to be Canadian. And I'm fine with the fact that Justin Trudeau is my prime minister. But you know what Jesus says? Jesus says of me that I'm actually a stranger here, that I'm actually a foreigner here, that my citizenship, well, it's in heaven and Jesus is my king. And as much as I love Canada and I'm fine with our prime minister, that just pales in comparison. It doesn't even register compared to the fact that my citizenship is in heaven and Jesus is my king. What in the world does all of that have to do with fellowship? This. What makes the church 
the church is not our politics. What makes the church the church is not the kind of music we like or our take on eschatology. What pulls the church into community is not our ethnicity. It's not our culture. It's not based on our socioeconomic standing. What pulls the church into community is Jesus plus nothing. Not Jesus plus this building I like, not Jesus plus these programs I like, not Jesus plus this music I like. It's Jesus plus nothing. That was true for the early church, and hopefully that is true for us as well. Jesus plus nothing. The early church was family. Um, if that person over there is my brother, and that that person is also your brother, that makes us brothers or brother and sister. We're family. God is our father. Jesus is not just king, he's savior, and he's not just savior, he's our brother, and that makes us family. And in families, we don't always agree about everything. And the same is true in church families. Think about Sobel Church. Sobel Church represents a bunch of different opinions on any number of topics. And I'm sure that was the case in the early church too. And it's fine to have a whole variety of opinions. It's possible to have a whole variety of opinions and one attitude. Multiple opinions, one attitude. Well, what is that one attitude? Well, the Apostle Paul puts it this way in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5. He says, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. And I'm going to read... Uh, the rest of these verses here that describe the attitude of Jesus. But as I do so, think about the attitude of Jesus in relation to power, wealth, and recognition. Verse six, though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Our koinonia, our commonality. Our connectedness in Jesus is so strong. It is so powerful that it can bear the weight of differences of opinions about matters of secondary importance. One attitude. Lots of opinions. That just makes life interesting. But one attitude. We can have a variety of opinions on politics. We can have a variety of opinions on vaccines and masks and eschatology, and music, and programs, and buildings. Again, that makes church interesting, but what pulls us together into community is Jesus, plus nothing. And we must be so careful to not let our differences of opinions divide us when it's Jesus who connects us. By the way, I think the fellowship that was true of this early church is best replicated in our day in small groups. Small groups really was the early church. They met together in homes, they ate together in homes, they prayed, they worshiped, they cared for one another in homes. Well, let me, um, let me try and land this plane here. Um, I watched a documentary on Netflix maybe a couple of years ago. Um, and it was called Seven Days Out. And it, it had six episodes. And basically, each episode was about some major event. Uh, one was a big dog show. One was the Kentucky Derby. One was some big fashion show. Um, and basically, this documentary chronicled the last seven days of planning before the event got, uh, uh, got, got started, got rolled out. Um, 
and I'm, I'm a terrible event planner. I'm not a good detail person. So I watched this documentary thinking maybe I can pick up some tips. One of the episodes, the one that intrigued me the most was about a restaurant. And it was a restaurant in New York City called 11 Madison Park. And in 2017, this New York restaurant, 11 Madison Park, had two owners, a guy by the name of Will Guadara and Daniel Hume. Will Guadara was the, he looked after the front part of the restaurant, the, the seating, the serving, and so on. And the other guy, Daniel Hume, was the head chef, and he had this army of chefs uh, working under him. And in 2017, this restaurant, 11 Madison Park in New York, was named one of the 50 top restaurants in the world. And in fact, of those 50, it ended up winning the number one spot. In 2017, it was literally named the world's best restaurant. And as soon as that happened, these two owners took an incredibly bold step and they closed the place down for four months to do a total gut job renovation. And so the episode of this documentary that dealt with this restaurant chronicled the final seven days of preparations before reopening. It was mind-boggling attention to detail. It was really fascinating. In fact, I was so fascinated by it, I actually Googled this restaurant because I wanted to learn a little bit more about it. And I saw a little interview clip between, uh, with, with these two owners, and I found it really interesting. Daniel Hume, the chef guy, looked after the back in the kitchen, the chefs. He said, you know what? We're really not in the food business although they serve world-class cuisine. And then Will Guadara, the, the, the front-end guy, the, the, the service guy, said, we're really not in the restaurant business, although they have this incredible space and, and service that is second to none. What they both said, we're actually in the people business. In fact, what they said was, this is a place where people come and they bring their treasure. And by treasure, they didn't mean money, although this is a very expensive restaurant to go to. They said people come to this restaurant um, for the most important moments of their life. They come to this restaurant, not, not, by, not, not on a whim, like it's not the kind of restaurant where you're walking down the sidewalk and you... Um, you just look at this restaurant and say, hey, let's go in there for lunch. It's not that kind of place. You've got to make reservations like months in advance. They said people come here and they bring their treasure. They come here to um, propose marriage. They come here to celebrate 25 years of sobriety. They come to celebrate the last cancer treatment. They come to celebrate 50 years of, of marriage. They bring their treasure. And these two owners said, what people really want to know about us, is this a safe place for me to bring my treasure? Can I trust you with my treasure? Can I trust you with the most important things in my life? Because you don't get a second chance at those. You don't get a do-over on those kinds of things. And so I thought about, I thought about Sabal Church and SCF Online. And, and, and in my heart, what I really want SCF online to be and what I want Sobble Church in person to be is a safe place where people can bring their treasure. I really think that's what people are looking for. They're asking the question, is this a safe place? Can I trust you with my treasure? Can I trust you with my story, with my pain, with my guilt, with my shame, with my abuse, with my sin? And that's what, I, that's what I want for our church. That's what I want for our small groups. Safe places where people can come and bring that which is most sacred to them, their story. Can I trust you with my story? Can I really be loved? Can I really belong? Can I really find grace and space so that I can find out who it is that God created me to be? You know, this Acts 2 church, was so diverse, we've, we've talked about that already, so diverse, humanly speaking, I don't think they really had a reason to be together, but they were pulled into community by their koinonia, and Jesus was their koinonia, he was their commonality, he was their community,
connectedness. It was Jesus that pulled them together into community, not preaching, not a building, not programs, not music, not politics. It was Jesus. Jesus was at the center. In this church, they, were, they met in small groups, and, and these small groups were safe places for people to bring their, their treasure, their, their diversity. Acts 2.47 says that this group enjoyed the goodwill of all the people. Like, imagine, think about that. What else on planet Earth enjoys the goodwill of all the people? This church did. Why? Well, think of how compelling it is that such a diverse group exists together in love and unity, devoted to fellowship, devoted to what they held in common, which was Jesus. I can't think of anything else that does that. In this early church, humanly speaking, had no reason to be together, nothing in common except Jesus, plus nothing. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we confess that you are Lord, you are King, you are Savior. We love your kingdom. You are the head of the church. The church is your body. Would you teach us Jesus? the beauty of our connectedness together in you. And may that be so compelling that it provides a picture to our community that is met with goodwill. In Jesus' name, amen. See you next time. If you have a need in your life today that you would like prayer for, I would encourage you to share that with someone. It's so important for us to stand together in prayer. We weren't built to carry the weight of all that the world can throw at us any given week, which is why being in a community, supporting one another, and linking arms in prayer is vital. Ask a friend or someone close to you to pray with you, or let us know here at the church and we can join you in prayer. We can keep your prayer request confidential or share it with our prayer groups that meet throughout the week. Let us know how we can pray for you by going to prayer.sobblechurch.ca. In John chapter 17, we see Jesus pray for his disciples, but not just his disciples, for us as well. In verse 20, he says, I'm praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. I pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one, as you are in me, Father, and I am in you. And may they be in us so that the world will believe you sent me. I have given them the glory you gave me, so they may be one as we are one. I am in them and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. Well, that's it for today. We hope that you have a great week, that you represent the family name well, and that you join us again at any of our three services, 9 a.m. or 11 a.m. in person, 10 a.m. right here online, or catch up anytime after on our YouTube page by searching for Sobble Church. Have a great week.